Holy friends, today I would like to share with you a scripture that comes to us from the Gospel of Matthew. This is Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 to 28. This is a continuation of where we left off last week and the week before. This is Jesus foretelling his death and resurrection. This is the New Revised Standard Version. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God, forbid it. This must never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan, for you are a stumbling block, and for you are setting your minds not on divine, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who will lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man is to come with his angels and glory of his Father, and he will repay everyone with what he has done. Truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. My friends, for y'all that have listened to me for the past several years, you should know that this is one of my favorite texts to talk about. This idea about picking up our cross and following Christ and about recognizing who we are and the choices we make each and every day that allow us to follow the ways of Christ. But I want to take a different spin on it. As we've been talking about last week and we'll continue on this coming week, we've been focusing on Peter a lot. So I want to talk about Peter a little bit more in the story talk about what Jesus says to him, what that means for us here as disciples, and continue on that journey to remember this promise that God has given us, this promise of eternal life, forgiveness of sins, and a new beginning that this world will never fully understand. But we know as disciples in Christ Jesus, he showed us love before we showed him love. So let's get straight into it. There's not a whole lot that we're missing as you'll notice, last week is directly on top where we talked about Peter's declaration. We had that so-called messianic secret, right? This idea that Peter had finally learned that Jesus is the Messiah, and he shared it. And that reminds us that we're not talking about a one-time person. We're not talking about Jesus who just lived and was this great guy and taught people about righteousness, and then he passed on and he never returned. Because we serve a living, true God that did return when he passed, as he prophesied over and over and over, and in this very text, he comes back three days later, exactly as he said, because he's not just a God for today. He is a God for tomorrow and a God of yesterday. There is one thing I want to talk about briefly, though. As I've mentioned, Peter has this back-and-forth relationship with God, as you'll notice. This past week, he was granted, you know, this ability to be the rock of the church, right? He has this ability to stand steadfast and share and be the foundation on which the church will be built, which we see through the book of Acts. But if you remember two weeks ago, he tried to get rid of a Canaanite woman who Jesus declared was a woman of great faith. If you remember three weeks ago, he was trying to go and walk on water with Christ, but he fell down into the water. The thing about that, first of all, is sometimes we forget we like to focus on the failure of Peter, yet we forget about the boldness of Peter, right? As, Jesus, as Peter got out of the boat and tried to walk with Jesus, what were the other disciples doing? They were hanging out in the boat. They were peeking over the edge, trying to see what's happening. But Peter took that step forward, that bold step of uncomfort, not knowing what would happen next. But he took that step, trusting in the Lord and trusting in God's ability to keep him safe. Now, when I say safe, it might be completely different than any of us are thinking of our definitions of safe, and we'll get to that in a minute. But this idea that Christ is here for us and wants to lead us on a radical, crazy path that may not look like anything that the world says it should, it may not come with a lot of riches, it may not come with many possessions, but it will come with so much love and joy and life, a mere fraction of what we have promised. So there's one little section I want to talk about now. So it's in between that section of walking on water and what we talked about last week. 
It's in chapter 16, and so it's on verse 5, and it goes until verse 12. So Jesus is having this speech, right? And he's talking to the scribes and Pharisees, and he tells them that they are like leaven instead of bread, and they're going to make the whole loaf become leaven. Now you might be thinking, hey, that's not so bad, right? Like, we like nice fluffy bread. We don't like flat bread all the time. So why is this leaven such a big deal? Well, to remember, leaven in this ancient culture would be a symbol of corruption because you're carrying around this moldy piece of bread that you go and stick into other pieces of bread to try to transfer the yeast so that it can begin to rise on its own. It's, uh, it's like sourdough culture, right? It's this idea that you keep something that is continually fermenting to stick it into more bread and make more bread. It's a very simple way to transfer yeast to be able to help things grow. But it was a symbol of corruption because it was unclean. And it's this idea that if we are not careful, especially the scribes and Pharisees, that if we're not careful in what we believe and what we say, that things can continue to grow and fester and become worse for everyone. All of that aside, literally the next scripture, the disciples look at Christ, shake their, scratch their heads, and they're like, Jesus, why are you talking about bread? And I can imagine just the sigh that Jesus gives after that moment after being with him for years and hearing these parables and stories and just the sigh that can be heard 2,000 years later and across an ocean because they're still not getting it. They're not understanding these stories that Christ is saying. And right here we see a very great example of Peter doing the same thing. So at first you can take this one of two ways. As Peter hears the message that Christ is giving, that the scribes and Pharisees will be taking me, I'm going to be arrested, killed, but I will come back in three days. Peter pulls him aside and starts yelling at him. And he says, Jesus, God forbid it. We cannot let this happen to you. And Jesus, of course, says the famous lines, get behind me, Satan, right? He's calling his own disciple, the one that he just praised literally three verses ago. It's not even like it was chapters ago. It just happened. He said, you are the one of great faith. You will build this church, but get behind me, Satan, right? It's this transition and flip, this idea that Peter was promised to be so good, but he makes a mistake, it sounds like. But what is that mistake? Because it doesn't really come out very well in this text. It's a mistake that comes out of us, a mistake that we're all very familiar with, a mistake of complacency something that we are comfortable with what we know, and we are uncomfortable with what we do not know. So Peter is sitting here, and he hears this message that Jesus is going to die. Jesus is going to be taken away, he's going to die, and he's going to come back. And Peter's mad, he's upset. Maybe he's worried that he's going to be losing one of his best friends, somebody he's followed for years. Maybe he's worried that the prophecies aren't really true, and even though he's been told that they are, maybe he's not ready to believe it. But let me give you more of a radical take on this. And this might make you think in a different way. So during the first century in Judea, there is a group of people that are called the Zealots, right? We actually have one of them in the Bible. His name is Simon the Zealot. He's a disciple that follows around Jesus. So Zealot isn't just a term, right? It's not just an adjective that you threw on to him. Like, oh yeah, well, he's just really excited and he's really passionate. No, the Zealot party was a group that was coming forth in Judea and they believed that the Romans were there unrightfully, and that there had to be military action to take them out. So these are people who were willing to commit crimes, they were willing to commit violence and murder in order to have the Roman people leave. And there's a, there's a lot of, we, this is a very deep rabbit hole that we're about to jump into, so I'll try to keep it as base as possible. Some scholars, and myself included, would say that perhaps Peter is a zealot. And he wants this kingdom to come by that's comfortable for him. He doesn't have to worry about dying because he's never experienced death for himself. He's seen it with others, but he's never felt it on his own. He's comfortable with this idea that Jesus will bring forth an army of angels and send Rome packing so that they can go and have the promised land back. Like God told them that they would from the beginning of the time of Abraham. This has been their promise, and they latched this idea that they need it any way that they can without recognizing that this promised land, this kingdom that Christ is talking about, may not truly be a physical location, 
But we love physical locations because it's comfortable and it's easy and it helps us understand something that's in our hearts, something that we can visualize, right? One of the biggest problems for us as disciples is that visualization. We always sit there and pray and we're kind of sitting there on the edge and say, God, I want to do this, but please show me a sign. We act like the prophets of old. We're like, God, make this miracle happen so I know this is what I'm supposed to do. But sometimes we get radio silence. Sometimes we get an unknown feeling inside of us and it makes us feel strange, but it, it doesn't feel right, but it doesn't feel bad either. These strange feelings are what we all get, my friends, on how we continue to be the disciples that we've been called to be. And I can tell you that there is a great way to continue to understand those feelings that we get, to continue to work towards this relationship with God that we talk about, because it is more than a relationship. I know a lot of religion this day, especially non-denomination, likes to throw, oh, well, it's not a religion, it's a relationship. Well, in God's kingdom, it's both, because it's a bit of a servitude into the kingdom of heaven, but it's also this relationship with the creator that made us and the one who wants us to know him because he knows everything about us, but he wants us to know him and to follow him and do everything that he's asked us to do. And the reason we can know this, the reason we can continue on and become stronger in our spiritual ability is to do exactly what Christ says. At the end, he talks about pick up your cross and follow me. Crosses are not comfortable. Crosses can be heavy. Crosses can be difficult to carry if you're going over a bridge or over a river or something like that. They're dense things that are placed on your shoulder. And you feel it each and every step that you are carrying this cross. And the disciples of this time would be very familiar with what a cross was. Crosses were used all throughout the Roman provinces as a way of crucifixion and execution for those who were not worthy of a standard execution. These people that were seen as less than citizens, they were seen as simply numbers on a census, were given this punishment of the cross. And Christ is telling us to pick up this cross and follow him, to live each and every day, not on what we believe is comfortable, not on what we believe is right, not because what we personally believe is good, but because of what God has told us is good, what Christ has showed us is good. And you might be thinking, oh, well, it's kind of the same thing because everyone wants to be a good person, right? Well, not exactly. Because in our world today, some people would say it's well and good to leave somebody alone on the street. If you see a car on the side of the road that can't get going, the rest of the world would say, you know, you're too busy. Someone else can do that. Maybe you see somebody who is hungry on the side of McDonald's and, you know, the world tells us we're not supposed to talk to people that we don't know. We're not supposed to teach them and show them the love of Christ. So when we go being well and good in the world, we don't have that cross anymore. We don't have that, that weight on our shoulder to remind us of who we are. And I can say, as we continue to be disciples and carry that cross, that burden on our shoulder begins to feel more like a hand, the hand of Christ Jesus, leading us and showing us what comes next each and every day. So my friends, just like Peter, we like to be complacent. We like to sit here and say, oh, well, you know, everything's going great. Everything is fine because I'm healthy, I'm happy, and I have plenty of money and possessions. I'm good. But Christ tells us to look beyond what we see. As he tells Peter, stop looking at things with your human eyes and look at things with the eyes of the divine. Continue to search for him, seek him, and the answers do come. Again, they may not be answers that we like. You might have to talk to people we would have never assumed you wanted to talk to. We might have to give possessions away that we never thought that we would ever have to get rid of. But this is not our kingdom. This world is not our place. Our kingdom is in heaven. And Christ has already taught us in this scripture that what we give away on earth, we will receive in heaven. So my holy friends, don't get so stuck up on everything that we have. <laughs> Don't get so caught up in our possessions, our jobs, our professions, because it can all be taken away in an instant. 
What's important is to remember the love of Christ and remember the message he has shared with each and every one of us. That he is not just a God for the moment, but he is a God for all time with love and mercy and atonement for all. And we are blessed to be that advocate, to share that message with the world. So my friends, don't wait. Be like Peter. You're going to make mistakes. But I promise you, it will be okay. Amen? Amen. Praise to God and the highest, my holy friends.